Well, happy happy Friday, everyone. Um, should we wait maybe like one more minute for people to come in and then get started? And you know, while we're waiting, today is um, just the, the last day, so we we've made it. Um, and now we get to see all these really cool presentations from all the participants um, who are willing to share some results. So we have uh, 12 people lined up. Um, some are, uh, I believe one of them is at least a recording, uh, but I'm really interested to see a lot of the, the work. I, I've only seen two of the presentations myself. So um, yeah, really looking forward to it. And I guess with that, um, why don't we go ahead and get started? And our first speaker will be Felix. So Felix, if you don't mind uh, sharing, um, we're gonna be looking at understanding seismic swarm precursors, uh, which uh, is not something in my wheelhouse. So take it away. You should be able to share your screen. Yeah, perfect. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, my name is Felix Rodriguez Cardoso. I am postdoctoral research scholar at the University of South Florida. I did my master and PhD in Mexico, but I'm originally from Colombia. And I work currently with Professor Jochen Brandmiller here in USF in Tampa. So just for giving a little bit of context about why I choose this study region, so this is Iceland. Iceland. I did my PhD thesis about seismicity there. And today uh, I'm going to talk a little bit very briefly about this region of Iceland, which is the Reykjanes Peninsula in the Southwest of the country, close to the capital Reykjavik. And what happened there is in, in uh, March, 2021, a fissure eruption happened in the Reykjanes Peninsula precisely. And that fissure eruption was preceded by a very intense seismic swarm. So these circles that you see here from different colors is the seismicity registered before the eruption happened. So basically I have been very interesting, interested on studying the seismic source parameters of the seismicity, not only of this uh, eruption, but also from uh, all the eruptions in in general that happened also in 2022 and currently happening in 2023. So, but because of time and my understanding about INSAR, because I, ha I had any idea about, I had any, any idea about INSAR, I just made an interprogram for 2021. So basically I download this frame uh, or two frames in this region, basically. One frame is 23rd of February and the second one is the 7th of March in 2021. And in between those dates, uh, magnitude 5.5 earthquake happened. That actually is the largest earthquakes for that eruption or the largest earthquake registered before that eruption. So basically I would like to see if that uh, large earthquake is somehow related with uh, some magmatic intrusion, intrusion that preceded the, the fissure eruption. So basically those are the results I obtained. Uh, on the left side is the wrap interferogram. So you can see some very clear fringe and fringes. And on the right side is the unwrapped interferogram. So, but the reality is not only uh, one earthquake happened. In fact, in between those dates or the two images, three large earthquakes happened. The largest one, but two others from magnitude about five. So basically, in my poor understanding of the uh, on rapid interferogram, and thanks to the help of, of uh, my mentor, Catherine and David that replaced her yesterday. Basically, this is the perspective of the satellite, it's a descending image. And basically what you can see here is one side of the uh, fold, let's say, or the ridge is moving toward the satellite and the other side is moving away to the satellite. So this is somehow, in agreement with the uh, intrusion of magma and an opening reach process or an uplifting process, because we don't know yet because we haven't unwrapped in terms of the 
uh, absolute coordinates. So this is just toward the satellite and away from it. So if we compare uh, those images with the, um, the already published one, this is not anything new at all. So the main publication about this event was published by Sigmundson and co-workers in 2022. It's a nature paper. So basically, uh, he was able to make two inter programs in the same time frame as I did, basically because he used S1A and S1B satellites combined for having a more temporal resolution. So basically, he was able to obtain two inter programs. So I think what we are seeing here is a combination of these two inter programs. So how? So it's it's pretty much uh, consistent. So I think encouraged to me to think that. Uh, the result is somehow decent. And if we see this result in the perspective of the GPS, also movements also published by Sik Mutson and, and co-workers, uh, the, the soil displacement, it's very consistent with the GPS signal. So basically the GPS showed that we have two movements like pulling apart from the main fold, which actually was the, the dike. And uh, so this is pretty consistent in our results. But the question here to me from the seismology perspective is beyond that the main signature here is an seismic process, which is the, the, the dike intrusion. There is anything about the earthquakes that we can observe here or everything is pure as, as seismic. So this is my question because basically um, the, larger, the largest earthquakes were reported previously as double couple earthquakes. But my results about the moment tensor, this is the thing that I do trying to figure out local mechanisms for uncommon sources derived from volcanic earthquakes. So what I found is uh, some of the earthquakes are non-double couple. So north-south um, double couple earthquakes are pretty common in this region, even before the eruption. This is quite interesting because you may think that the the, the, the probably the falls should be east-west, but the funny thing here is actually this is a very unique system named Bookshield Fall System and consists of uh, discrete segments of north-south oriented faults along the ridge. So basically what they claim, my colleagues in Iceland, is oh, though those earthquakes even during the eruption are north-south oriented faults trigger because of the magma intrusion. But somehow my intuition tells me that there is something in the intrusion process that are related with the earthquakes itself rather than just trigger seismicity. Something similar already happened as well in, in years, in previously years, like in 2014, for instance, there were a uh, eruption in the Holuran region in the Easter region of Iceland. And what we observe in terms of the seismicity is that the most of the earthquakes were very, very, very double coupled. So at that moment we thought, oh, this is an indication that the magma intrusion for this particular eruption is a seismic because most of the earthquakes are double coupled. So there is no any uh, indication that some of the crack opening processes is being observed in the earthquakes itself. But here it's completely different in my results in the eruption in the Reykjanes Peninsula because we do observe something that is more or something is that different from just poor north-south strike slip poles. So this is some moment tensor or focal mechanisms I obtained for the 2021 eruption from the 2022 eruption in August. And this is a very recent map I made in Pine GMT that I'm trying to move to Pine GMT. And we observed that the focal mechanisms are quite different from the different eruption stages. So this is something that is more than just north-south strike slip poles. And actually the non-double coupled components that actually is a measurement of how your earthquake can be described by just a pure planar fault is not very consistent as well. And we did a lot of uncertainty tests for having some reliability on those moment tensors. So basically we also compared the waveform similarities, something named hierarchical clustering we are working now. And we also observed that uh, the waveforms are different as well. And the stations, the distance between the station and the earthquake is pretty much similar. So we believe that the differences in the waveforms has to be related, have to be related with the seismic source itself. So the idea to me beyond this project is trying to use those uh, INSA results to see if there is anything, 
anything in the INSAR deformation that could be assigned to the earthquakes, just, just not just only the dike opening, because some of the focal mechanisms we have calculated are showing that there is a crack opening or something like this. So that's why I enrolled to this course and I'm very happy to, to be able now to use some tools about INSAR preprocessing. And that's it. So now the next steps are uh, to make the interferograms for the 2022 and the 2023 fissure eruptions. But in this case, it's a little bit challenging for me because the S1B satellite is no longer available. So basically I need to use only the S1A. And in for, for the, the frames for that satellite, my region interest falls precisely in between two frames. So I need to merge them and worry a little bit more. Probably it's something straightforward, but it's something that I need to learn. And David and Catherine already gave me some clues about working with this. This is some of the earthquakes that have happened for 2021 and 23 eruptions. So the largest one for those epochs. So this is the future step. So this is what I want to do. I want to work for with the interprograms 2022 and 2023. And I would like to see if I'm able or with some colleagues to invert the displacement we are observing and trying to see if there is any revisual displacement that we can explain with the focal mechanisms or the moment tensor itself. And that's it. Thank you so much. And by the way, thank you so much to Catherine. I don't know if she's here because she's ill, but she helped me a lot with this. I was bothering to her since July 5th, proposing this project and sending emails her almost every day. I cannot do this. I cannot do anything. <laughs> but she helped to me a lot and she was very patient. So uh, I, I thank, I, I, I'm, very, I'm very grateful to her. And that's it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That was great. Your um, your unwrapped interferograms looks very clean. So it looks like you are able to avoid a lot of atmospheric uh, noise. That was um, quite cool and a very extensive research. Um, does anyone have like a quick question or two? Otherwise, kind of in the interest of time, we we might uh, uh, continue on. So any any quick questions? Uh, no? Okay. Well, again, yeah, thank you so much for, for all that work. And if you do have questions, you think of it later, feel free to post in the, the Q&A, and I'm sure Felix will be happy to, to answer um, anything. Um, and just thank as a you. reminder, I forgot to say um, that the session is recorded. So um, uh, just just as a, a, just for your aware awareness. Um, and um, and I apologize in advance. I'm probably going to um, mispronounce a few of these names later. So please grant me some grace and uh, forgive me. But um, we'll continue on to our next speaker, which is John. Um, is John on? I can't see. Hi, yes. You're here? Okay. Yes, so feel free to go ahead and um, share your screen. And I believe John will be talking about some co-seismic deformation related to um, uh, an earthquake in Croatia. Okay, thank you. So I guess you, you can see my screen, right? No, we can't right now. I think, uh, Felix, you may need to stop sharing. Uh, ah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I, did, I thought I, I had already done it. Sorry. <laughs> it's, all, it's okay. And then... Uh, there we go. Yeah, okay. It's better now. Okay, uh, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is John. Um, I'm a master's student in France, and I'm currently doing uh, research on the Trinidad, which occurred uh, December 2020. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Just a short background about this event. It's a magnitude 6.4 earthquake, relatively large, uh, which occurred at the late, late 2020, so around the holidays. And this earthquake exhibited a red slip as we in this map from this place. Uh, showing the northwest trending fault. And what make 
what makes this earthquake special uh, is that this uh, the Balkans, this region here in Europe, uh, doesn't really experience a lot of large magnitude earthquakes. So this was a bit of a surprise for them, and especially that it occurred during the holidays. Uh, since this region is a low strain region, like there's a uh, reported less than five millimeter per year interseismic loading for this area. So uh, there is a need for a better assessment of the seismic risks in this, uh, actually, especially after the recent events that was very unexpected of them. So that's why uh, for this small GMTs are exercise, I also wanted to test uh, the software in this event. There's a simple uh, seismic deformation measurement based on single pair interferograms. And then aside from that, I was also curious about the case gradient mapping approach uh, based on this, uh, this works. And I wanted to try it out for this event as well in order to identify if there are any off-fault deformation uh, that occurred aside from the along the fault structure. Now I just uh, use Sentinel-1 data uh, of the descending trap. And here are the equation map. And what is here is that uh, here, especially near the fault structure, which is uh, due to the densely vegetated uh, character of this area. So it's quite a, an issue for uh, interferogram generation here because of that. And you can see here in the right, the interferogram filtered phase. And we see these fringes, but along that, there's a lot of noise uh, suspectedly due to the vegetation. So we look at the unwrap phase by SNAFU, and we see here the expected uh, displacement. So red going near the satellite, so going to the right, and here at this side going away from the satellite. And the largest displacement recorded by this interferogram is around 235 millimeters in Petrinia City. And we see here in this unwrap phase map, there's a lot of, of uh, gaps here. There's a lot of masked points because, uh, as I said, of the low correlation in this area. And this has been one of the major issues, really, in uh, doing INSAR in this space. And this, is, this has been uh, reported as well in previous publications. And after that, I also did a profile across perpendicular to the fault just to see how it looks like. And we see here this uh, pattern, which is kind of expected for uh, this type of earthquake, strike right lateral slip earthquake. Uh, and the first thing that I noted in this profile is that uh, at the edge of these profiles, to the southwest and to the northeast, this, which we expect to be to have stable, uh, stable ground at these parts. But we can see here that there is kind of a negative value displacement, negative shift, since this, these parts are supposed to be around zero, expectedly. So there's a need for post-processing uh, correction in this aspect. And then another thing that I noticed from the unwrap phase that I generated is as we look at the displacement close to the fault near zero here, uh, we see here that from very high values, it gradually decreases as we go toward the fault or toward the center, which is uh, really not realistic in, in terms of what to expect from a fault. 
so there may be there's a need to check the displacements here because maybe it's a unwrapping issue or so the, uh, I suspect there should be additional steps to do in order to have uh, more reliable uh, measurements or displacements in this air in this part of the interferon. And so the next part uh, of my objective would be to do the phase gradient maps as well. And these were my results. And you see here that doesn't look that good. It's very noisy looking and there's not much, uh, you don't see any features at all that could indicate, uh, it's not very clear at the very least here because uh, for this, uh, phase rated maps, I only use one interferometric pair, and it, this could be improved further if I did uh, more maps and stack them. But that's what I did. Uh, this was actually, uh, I made this before I learned how to use gmt -SAR. but yeah, I've already been exploring phase rated approach, so I had this initial results based on six interferometric pairs. And this was much better than what I had with just one pair. And uh, yeah, and I think this was the best I could do already for this area. And with that, I just wanted to like ask you guys maybe if there are other things that you could recommend uh, that I could do in order to improve uh, my face gradient maps. Like are there, could this still be improved further? And another point would be, I'm not really sure how to, I'm not entirely sure how to interpret these maps and maybe I would appreciate some uh, insights from you who have been working more on face gradient maps. So that's it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um... Yeah, the phase gradient stuff is nothing. I, I haven't done any of this before, but I know that Dave and Shalwa have done it for um, a couple of places, uh, including Ridge, uh, Ridgecrest. So Dave, maybe you have uh, yeah. some insight? I have, yeah, I have a quick answer. In in an area like this, that's with a lot of vegetation and it's decorrelated, the phase gradient is really difficult. But yeah. I, So I don't think you're going to do a lot better than you've done here. And we could go offline, but you also have to keep the highest resolution, like, not so much filtering and that kind of thing, but stacking phase gradients is that looks pretty good actually. I mean, for this area. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I guess it, this is it for. There's not much improvements then. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. That was great. Um, and again, if anyone has um, questions, I think we'll we'll move on to try to keep. Um, the total session under two hours. But if you have questions, um, feel free to put them into the chat or the, the Q&A. Um, OK, so our next talk will be by Mehmet, uh, looking at subsidence detection on peatland areas. Um, so is Mehmet on? Oh, yes, I see you're on. So yeah, feel free to share your screen. Um, can, can you see the slide? Yes, we can see you and we can hear you. So take it away. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to mention about subsidence detection on peatland areas and current time studying earth observation and geoinformatics management department and the University of Edinburgh, but normally I'm an engineering geologist. So just a small brief, uh, what is peatlands? They are peatland ecosystems, uh, oxygen poor uh, and not nutrition limited. And they cover 3% of global land surface, which is around 4 million square kilometers. They are pretty important because they are exceptional carbon sinks and they contain one third of the world's soil carbon. And keeping this carbon in these uh, peatlands are very important uh, because of, in terms of the climate change issues. Uh, but unfortunately, 12% of current peatlands have been degraded and climate change is worsening this situation. And also this situation is worsening climate change uh, because it can result carbon dioxide emission. Uh, 
so subsidence monitoring is uh, pretty important on peatlands uh, because um, because the carbon dioxide emission when the peatlands are subsidized, uh, they emit carbon dioxide and some conventional applications like leveling on or GNSS, they have limitations, special limitations, and airborne LIDAR is prohibitively expensive. And INSAR yeah, can be used for monitoring. Uh, and since it has high special and temporal coverage, and it can provide a vertical change with a millimeter pre precision. So my Purpose of my study is using open source methods having high spatial and temporal coverage with high precision for peatland subsidence monitoring. And I use GMT-SAR and why GMT-SAR? Because it's fully open source and it's actively kept up to date. And just an example of another option, uh, you can see just four days small course and you can see the fees. And I don't even mention about the license price, uh, but GMT SAR is fully free. And as we see, we can participate uh, beneficial and free courses, which is perfect. So my study area, uh, I picked three peatland areas just uh, on the cross border between Scotland and England. Uh, so they are close to each other. Uh, they are located in Cumbria. And my analysis, I um, generated 54 interferograms, and this is my base baseline map, a baseline plot, sorry. And my super master is here, by the way. And this is average coherence plots. And as you see um, these three uh, peatlands, uh, this the bigger one, Falshaw, has um, yeah um, lower coherence compared to others, and and this is the coherence time series plots. And yeah, as you see, generally average coherence is like 0 0.25, 0.20s. And this is a displacement velocity map uh, of the peatlands. Um, in fall show peatlands, uh, there are also some, uh, not only the subsidence, also, I mean, in terms of the results, some uplifting areas also observed. And this is the average displacement plot uh, time series of the three um, peatlands. Uh, While well, they are pretty, I mean, their um, trends are pretty similar. And also, uh, we discussed with Kong yesterday, and he just suggested me to use some uh, reference area which has higher coherence. And I just picked this area, which is very close to the peatlands. And it's like rocky outcrop area. Um, it has uh, 0.75, around 0.75 coherence. And I used this area as a reference area. And this is the all displacement uh, time series with the reference area. As you see, yeah, again, they have a similar um, trends. And just to remove the atmospheric uh, decoloration, um, just I differentiate the reference areas displacement values from the peatland displacement values. And this is the final uh, time series plots. Um, yeah, as you see, again, they have um, similar similar trends, uh, especially yeah, in the beginning, um, yeah, um, um, around end of the 2016. And I just want also want to show um, two interferogram couples as an example, uh, which is um, December 2016, uh, they have um, similar values and also, um November 17 this um area um, at 
at this time the trends are pretty different and that's why i just want to compare them and show them so this is the first one and yeah coherence uh, looks yeah higher than the other one and phase phase lifts and phase mark phase mask plots yeah and this is the other time uh, yeah coherence is yeah considerably lower and we can see some uh, yeah mm, some empty areas uh, which is filtered and this maybe compression is better so yeah on the upper side and yeah lower side you can see the coherence difference and um, line of sights uh, displacement values and face lifts and yeah also fa phase ma phase mask and phase filtered mask uh, compression uh, we can see the uh, the fur the end of 2016 uh, it provides uh, better um, results yeah this is end of my presentation no that was great um we do have a uh we do have a, a question in the chat it seems like a, a bit more of a, a general gmt star question it's um apart from interferograms and coherence maps what else what other products can be derived from gmt star um so i mean we can get information about like amplitude of the just from the star itself uh, i mean there's a lot of derived products that all stem from those from the from the phase and coherence uh i mean do any of the other instructors have i you know want to chime in on that i'm sorry can you repeat oh it's not really a question for you oh, okay. per se. yeah yeah um i think I, Dave? I would say one thing we didn't really talk about was um a long track interferometry i know kong does a lot of that and and also pixel tracking maybe we could do this offline we could try to answer the question that way gotcha um yeah uh, a question I had for you, Mehmet, was um, so your baseline plots, a lot of them looked like your interferograms were quite sequential. Um, mm -hmm. You had a few that had some crossover, but how did you decide or what, uh, like, how did you decide to do kind of these very short temporal baseline um, interferograms rather than mm -hmm. having more connections? Because sometimes having more connections can help. Um, provide some data redundancy. Um, so I was just curious um, if you just did that because the coherence was going to be low regardless or kind of the strategy behind doing these uh, shorter mm -hmm. temporal baseline interferograms. Mm -hmm. Well, well uh, since uh, peatlands have um, dynamic uh, surface um, specifications, I just want to try as much as yeah, the, the close scenes to each other so and yeah i just created like a chain interferogram se series and yeah each one has just one connection and um, yeah and since the because of the water and uh, vegetation um i thought this is the reason for the low coherence and yeah because uh, for some settlement areas, um, I have pretty good coherence. So yeah, that's why um, I didn't change the baseline plots and the interferogram couples. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, it could be worth looking at making a few longer interferograms because um, uh, that might help with maybe some of the uh, atmospheric noise uh, and help smooth some of the your time series but um this is very this is very cool i have been doing a little bit of, of peatland uh, subsidence myself um mm -hmm. and i mean do you do you have an idea of like in those peatlands when 
uh, changes were occurring. So like typically it's, if you build a canal, you're draining the peatland, that's what's causing subsidence or, or mm-hmm. something like that. Um, do you have information about land use in that area that would help inform? Um, well, um, well, actually the, all of them, I mean, all the area, it's a nature reserve. And even the, the um, farming areas around the peatlands, uh, that they, they are uh, under control and they are not privates uh, because you know farming activities as as you know can directly affect the water table so that uh, this area is all reserved uh, so i think um maybe the things just uh, the subsidence or the um, the movements they are related with the um i don't know whether effects and one of um, my other idea is uh, maybe it's not subsidence maybe just the water on the surface is changed um okay this is not a real photo but uh, as we see yeah there is a water on the surface and maybe if the if this water vanished or dried i don't know and i think it's going to be like it's subsidized but the area is not subsidized just the water gotcha. is gone so maybe just the natural climatic condition yeah 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 yeah, yeah absolutely um so but uh honestly i didn't uh, visit the area uh but uh yeah they are nature reserve and they are actively uh, protecting gotcha yeah well thank you so much that was great um I think we'll move on to our next talk. Mm-hmm. So our next, our next talk is it's actually um, was done as a uh, a joint joint project with uh, Ricardo and Letizia. Um, so I don't either one of you, uh, you're together, perfect. So uh, go ahead <laughs> for you to uh, to share and uh, discuss it's uh, some line of sight maps over um, the Central Italy earthquake in 2016, I believe. Yes. Okay, I'll share my screen. Can you see the screen? Yep, perfect. So, hi everyone. Uh, My name is Letizia and uh, this is uh, Ricardo. We are uh, both uh, PhD students uh, at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Bologna. Uh, this is the first time that uh, we uh, we do uh, INSAR and uh, we use uh, GMTSAR and uh, for this uh, first trial we decided to uh, study the Central Italy earthquake uh, of the 2016. Um, this earthquake uh, um, occurred during the night of the 24 August 2016 and um, it had a, uh, with a magnitude, uh, moment magnitude of uh, 6.0. Uh, it was a really damaging earthquake. In fact, uh, uh, we can see here in the picture a matrice that was uh, destroyed. A lot of buildings uh, were destroyed and uh, we had a lot of casualties. And here we can see the uh, shake map, uh, the intensity map made by the INGB. Uh, the National uh, uh, Institute for uh, Geophysics uh, and Volcanology here in Italy. Um, So we downloaded the DIM DIM, as a first uh, point uh, using uh, the uh, CSH uh, uh, script uh, available uh, with the GMTSAR. And then uh, we downloaded the Sentinel-1 data on the Alaska satellite uh, facility. Um, uh, this uh, was the scene available for uh, our study area. Uh, we uh, downloaded two descending orbits uh, related to this scene. And um, uh, the first one is uh, relative to the uh, to three days before the earthquake. Earthquake. The second one is relative to um, three days after the earthquake. And uh, both of them are descending, but uh, one is um, of Sentinel One A, and the other one uh, is uh, from Sentinel One B. Um, then uh, we um, we use the um, 
GMT SAR uh, to obtain the results uh, to, uh, to do the analysis uh, and uh, we um, obtain this correlation map. Uh, we can see in black uh, uh, a low correlation uh, due to the um, Adriatic Sea. And there are also black regions uh, here near the um, hypocenter, uh, maybe because there is a lot of vegetation also here. Uh, here there are the Apennines, uh, so yeah, it's probably vegetation. Um, we obtained the uh, interferograms, uh, um, unfiltered and uh, filtered for the subswath uh, two and three. We discarded the sub subswath uh, one because uh, it wasn't near the hypocenter, so uh, we thought that that wasn't important for our study. And uh, we can see, uh, for example, here um, that there are some tropospheric effects, uh, these blue lines, uh, that were almost uh, uh, corrected uh, or deleted by the, the filtering. Uh, at the end, we obtained these two uh, maps. Um, the merged interferogram, unwrapped merged interferogram in geographic uh, coordinates and then we obtained the uh, line of sight displacement in millimeter where uh, we can see the uh, region of uh, subsidence and uh, the region of uh, uplift that are um, uh, in agreement uh, with the normal fault uh, um, that was uh, obtained by previous studies so yes uh, that's what we did uh, thank you Yeah, thank you so much. Those are uh, very cool uh, images. Do we have any uh, questions? No. Um, one of the uh, I was going to ask. Yeah, because I know you you had been working on uh, the, some of the filtering. Um, did you have a chance to explore that a little bit more, or? Yes, we did, uh, but um, uh, we increased the uh, the wavelength. Six to four hundred. Uh, yes, but oh. there weren't changes, so okay. at least in the, in the near yeah. field, uh, the, the changes right. were was very Only, uh, um, at the edge of the scene. There were some changes, but not so important. So we decided to uh, to keep, keep uh, the yeah. default value. Yeah, gotcha. And um, the run times for that were. About the same for you as well. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, that was good to know. Yeah. Thank you again for sharing. That was um, that's very cool. Um, so we'll move on to our our fifth talk, um, which is Beatrice, um, talking about earthquakes in Tanzania. I don't actually see a Beatrice here. Okay. Um, I think she was she was hoping the interferograms would be finished by now, but maybe they haven't been uh, finished. So, I gotcha. Well, we do have a little bit of a small amount of time. Um, well, there is one question that was for Letizia, um about the the line of sight orientation. Um, so I I I wonder. I'm not sure exactly what they mean. If it was uh, if you could talk a little bit more about that. Um, I think maybe they're talking about is it ascending or descending is what you mean, or are you talking about the um, the direction of motion? This is from Felix. Uh, yeah, there were both this, mm, descending orbits, but yeah, we we actually didn't check the, the precise path of the of the orbits. Yeah. No, uh, uh, I checked them. Yes. I check. yeah. oh. uh, the, the baseline uh, was really short for the two scenes. Yeah. Oh, okay, the baseline. Okay. okay, great. Um, so let's move on to the, the next talk then, uh, which is by Mustafa, uh, related to um, um, aquifer related subsidence across Iran. So is Mustafa online? He's another person I don't see on. Okay. 
Um, well, maybe maybe if they pop on a little bit later, they can they can go at the end. Um, so then we'll just continue. Um, we have um, Arif. Uh, is that yeah, Arif about small earthquakes in central Java with ALS two. I'm sorry, you guys. These are all my students, and I guess they're not here. <laughs> I I thought I communicated to them the right time, but um, okay. Um, well, okay. Well, in that case, we'll go ahead and um, we have a, another one from uh, Nia. This is a recorded talk about um, ice sheets and insar. So I think Melissa, if you're willing to play that. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Nia, and today I'm going to present you about ice sheet and INSAR. This is a picture of Ilulisat Ice River in Greenland. Well, I hope I pronounced the Ilulisat right because I tried several times at home and I don't think I succeed. So if you know how to pronounce it, let me know afterward. Um, this picture is just a like very beautiful ice sheet extending to the ocean. So I want to show it to everyone. Uh, this one is more scientific, which um, show the, like the structure of an ice sheet. The snow falling from the sky on the center um, of the ice sheet and compact into ice. Ice follow the deep blue arrow, this ice flow line. Um, it flows to the edges of the ice sheet. So it could flow to the ground where it become melt water and run off. It could, it could also flow to the ocean where it become a part of ice shelf that floating in the ocean. The difference is that um, ice shelf is like a ice cube in a glass. If the ice cube melts, the water level in the glass won't rise. So if ice, sheet melt, uh, ice shelf melt, the sea level won't be affected directly. But this transformation of the mass sitting on the land to the mass floating on the ocean is what contribute to sea level rise. And uh, I will skip this slide. So this is the velocity map of Greenland. And it show it just like where my study area is, it like this part. Um, and we can see that the, the red color represent the slowest velocity and the near purple, like this color represent the highest velocity. So on the edge, the ice flow really quick. And in the center line, we call this ice divide. The ice do not flow very quick. And on the east side, we can also see ice flow in a stream. Uh, we call it ice stream. Um, and for the remote sensing part about radar SAR, inside, I won't get into deep because we already learned those in the lecture. But for the radar, uh, I just want to emphasize that we have two properties to record. The first one is the power of return signal, which depends on the surface property, and it becomes amplitude in SAR image. The second one is time of transmission, and it's it's based on the surface like height. And this one becomes phase in the later SAR image. So what is SAR? For a real aperture radar, um the antenna look at side um at, at uh, not directly below it, but on the side side ground um, and there's two resolution the first one is the resolution in the range direction the second one is the azimuth resolution the azimuth resolution is directly related with the length of antenna for longer uh, for longer antenna the resolution is finer but because we cannot send like 10 kilometer antenna to the space people create another way to achieve finer resolution in azimuth direction it is called SAR, synthetic aperture radar, where satellite flies um, um, and we acquire image during the flight time. And um, like the fly of the antenna is treated as the, the flight distance of the antenna is treated as the, um, the length of the antenna. And the image acquired during the flight time is combined together to get the image with a like, higher azimuth resolution. And when we have two star images, we can combine them and compare them. If the faces in the two star images changes, that's probably because 
the land has like deformation in the range direction. So the transmission of the wave, uh, the distance, transmission distance of the wave changes, which cause the phase changes. And that's how we estimate the ground deformation from the phase difference between two sign images. Uh, it's called interferor, uh, interferogram. And with this information, we can know more about ice velocity because ice flow from high ground to low ground. But when ice flow and the mass move, the lower ground become higher, the higher ground become lower. Um, that's like, that's how it's uh, re reflected in the surface deformation. Traditionally, we use stake and snow pit and GPS to measure the ice velocity. Stakes, basically, you put a stake, a stake on the ice and you come back here a few days later, you record the stake location again to see the velocity. But this is actually very, um, human, like human resource consuming or time consuming. Um, and there's much more area on Greenland that human cannot set its, uh, uh, set its foot on. So that's why remote sensing like INSAR is very important to the, um, to the assess of Greenland. The data I use is acquired from Alaska Satellite Facility uh, at 2016 with this three times. And the satellite use is Sentinel-1 with the polarization and sensor uh, and C band sensor. The orbit, I directly use the download Sentinel orbit Linux script to download from, uh, from the uh, ESA website. And also the, because I have difficulty in assessing the digital elevation model, I use three digital elevation model in the end to compare the, I, the difference between them. So the first one is the if list so I made, uh, when using made DM and CSH. Um, the second one is the SRTM 15 arc second. The third one is SRTM two arc minute. And, um, I think the second one is the highest resolution. The first one is the lowest resolution. The method is to use the script to process our image of closed state and try to use three different DM to see their difference. Also change configuration file because later on I encounter an arrow in the interferogram that you will see very soon. So this is the correlation image when I use ellipsoid as the DM. Uh, this is the image. Uh, the first thing come to my mind is that the center ice velocity is so quick. And um, that actually makes sense because this is area called ice stream where ice move really fast. And on the side, as the ice moves slower. So that is fine with me. <laughs> um, this is the medium resolution image. And we can see that on the side, the density of fringes kind of increase uh, compared to the first DM. So it does show that the if this soil is not enough to model the Greenland ice sheet. And for the third, the, the most fine, the, fi the finest uh, DM, it do not have much difference from the, the medium resolution DM. So I guess either there's not so much change between uh, this model and the last model, or maybe the Greenland is, is good enough to be estimated using a, a little bit low resolution DM. One thing common, one thing shared by all these three uh, in the program is that there's burst discontinuities and sub discontinuities. And that is because the Sentinel-1 COPS mode antenna rotate from back looking to forward looking direction during burst acquisition. The fast steering of antenna in azimuth direction um, create a larger variation of droplet centroid within a burst. So um, when we align two images, two images might not be well aligned in the azimuth direction because of the orbit velocity differences and burst timing differences. And those small misalignment in azimuth direction could be exaggerated by the, um, by the droplet centroid variation within a burst. And it caused the, the jump of the interfer, uh, the jump of the fringes or the discontinuities in the end product. And um, I was advised to change the configuration a bit, for example, to use the spectral diversity, um, which 
use the overlap area between two bursts to estimate the um like the change the offset in azimuth direction so using mode one which use a constant median value it do not do much like you can see two image have some changes but um this continuity is still very visible using mode two which stand for non-constant correction with match um with mapping the residual as mischief uh it looks a bit better um but still discontinuity is uh very visible and inspired from last uh last day's lecture i was thinking maybe the two data file is not like good enough so i changed the date and actually um with the same configuration and uh, the end result actually looks uh, like a bit better which is interesting and also the ice flow direction here do not change much. I mean, I didn't do quantitative analysis, so maybe still I'll buy something, but it's quite interesting result. And it's also show that maybe the atmospheric arrow in the image is not like very big or something. Um, and the result is that, yeah, topography do you have to use the, it's refine the image alignment and also remove the baseline dependent topography phase. Like this phase that contribute to the end phase diagram. There are some future things I want to try. For example, since there's like eyes have a large velocity in azimuth direction, I want to use pixel tracking and cross correlation technique to try to estimate the change like in azimuth direction. But the script is still running in my laptop. I want to try to use different satellite because um different band may get may give us different information. And this discontinuity is partly because of the mode of the satellite. So it creates such like such artifact in the end result. Um, I also want to try to see if ERI uh, ERA5 by the model can tell me something about the trouble sphere arrow. And from like today's presentation, there are GNSS correction on the inside. And I think there's GNS network in the Greenland too. So maybe that's another thing I, I can try to see if there's any interesting thing happen later on. And that's um, all the thing I have to say. Thank you very much for um, listening to the presentation. And I hope you enjoy our other presentation too. That was a, that was a great presentation. And I think it showed some really cool um, uh, uh, features and corrections uh, um, in uh, GMT SAR. So I know I've I've had the kind of the first uh, discontinuity as well. Um, it's occurred just um, in you know other locations like uh, you're in the Central Valley, California, and then applying an ESD um, that correction has has worked quite well. Um, uh, yeah, David. Yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, it could be the orbit is is aligned misaligned in the azimuth direction but that could actually be ice motion because the ice moves even on the sides of that ice stream it moves at a certain rate and one could use those burst overlap measurements to get another value for the ice motion outside so um, it's maybe not an error it's a signal in the ice yeah and i know that those areas are they move so quickly that um uh it's it can be quite difficult to um to to do insar over there some people do you know more of the pixel tracking i think that's a little bit better or this uh this double differencing of um these interferograms to really get at that ice motion um but yeah um and then we have another question that seems like it might be better suited kind of offline talking about the um what polarizations are used for different applications so all that um, I'll let someone answer that. Um, and I think we should move on to the next talk, uh, which is um, Shabam. Shabam. Sorry if I'm saying that uh, wrong, but active tectonics in northwestern Himalayas. Are you on? Oh, I see you're on.
I'm not sure if that's the same Siobhan. Or... Oh, is it not? No, no, I guess not. Um, okay. Well, if that's if they are not on, and then I guess we will move on to our next speaker, which is um, Turkir. Uh, so some differential interferometry. So if, yeah, feel free to share and um, um, and start. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you listen to me, please? Yes, you, we can see your screen uh, and we can hear you. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for providing me this opportunity uh, to learn from you, you people. Uh, this is not, uh, I have seen other presentations, they are really great presentations. Uh, this is not really such a presentation, it's, it's just what I did and what I learned from this GMT and GMT SAR a little bit. Uh, actually, I tried to install GMT SAR uh, and due to the some um, uh, Linux and other all these stops, uh, I was not able to install the GMT SAR and, and was not able to connect with my tutor. Uh, so luckily I got PY GMT SAR, it's Python wrapper of GMT SAR, and I used that uh, um, in the clouds and it was pretty good. Okay, uh, so basically what I did, I just give it a try uh, to compute the, uh, from two image of Sentinel-1A, uh, to compute the interferometer, interferometric gram. So this was my area. It's Chaman Park. It's it, it's in South. It's in Pakistan. It's in the uh, Balochistan area of Pakistan. So here it is the map I prepared by GMT. Uh, so it's pretty looking map, and our areas lie here. So what I did, I just downloaded the data uh, uh, and uh, tried to build a uh, interferogram. Uh, so this was the interferogram that uh, unwrapped phase, and this was the uh, on the background. I it, it was just the uh, topographic map of that area. So and then oh, I just generated the correlation, and then this is the uh, line of sight displacement. Uh, uh, it's my first time to do all this stuff. So I am pretty excited to do that. Although for you people, uh, perspective of you, it's, it's not really something great, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it helped me a lot to understand. So I will explore the further things and will come to you guys or other uh, for help and to do things really. Mm. So here's uh, just the, these are just the pretty looking uh, map uh, that I prepared for the first time, interferogram, correlational, line of sight displacement. So this was not really an, uh, a presentation that you people are hoping for, but nonetheless, this is what I did in very short time. No, this is great. Uh, and this is definitely kind of a goal of the whole workshop is just to, um, to, to get you started. And um, and so I think, you know, from here, you you really now have a lot of the tools to kind of move forward. Um, and, you know, you can start looking at some some cool features, so whether it's an earthquake or subsidence or yes. or, or anything. Um, and so, yeah, just, just getting, you know, even, you know, with the, the Pi GMT star, getting this to work, um, I think this is a great start. Um, and I hope that, you know, it instills some excitement for you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think some of the next things are you start building up a set of interferograms and uh, maybe, you know, thinking about playing around with merging either a long track or um, looking at the other subswaths. So, um, yeah, do you, what are your kind of future, future goals um, going forward? Well, uh, I... I would like to apply these things on the uh, subsidence. Okay, there are a lot of oil fields in Pakistan where mm, there's no previous studies. Uh, there are some uh, saline and uh, wetlands uh, where we can apply that. And even along the Chamber Fault or uh, even the earthquakes. So we can apply on a lot of things that the geological related thing. And one thing is that landslides, there are some active landslides in Pakistan. 
Uh, so let's see if I progress, I, if I make any progress in that regard. Uh, but nonetheless, it was the first step and I will, I, I hope that I will do something with that uh, scientifically. Um, so first thing is to just to uh, uh, understand and translate this interfer uh, interferogram uh, and to interpret them, it is really tough. Uh, but okay, let's see how it will evolve in the time. Yeah, thanks. Great. Um, does, does anyone have any other questions, um, um, comments about using uh, the GMT or Pi GMT SAR or anything like that? No? Okay, I think we have two more talks and then um, that's the kind of the end of our list. So let's we can move on to um, to here, um, who will be talking about some of the uh, some or showing some unwrapped and line of sight maps for the um, uh, uh, 2021 Haiti earthquake. And then I believe there's some atmospheric corrections applied to that as well. So yeah, so here if you could just yeah stop share perfect, and then. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm making sure your screen too. <laughs> Started from the end. <laughs> uh, can you see my screen? Yes, all good. Okay, perfect. Uh, I am Tahir Javed. Uh, from University of Trieste, Italy. Uh, there is a slight change in the in the title because yesterday I was about to uh, describe about the co-seismic deformation, but uh, in the afternoon I processed another image and found some short signal of the co-seismic deformation as well for the Haiti earthquake that was occurred on in 2021. Uh, this is the study area in which uh, uh, on which the magnitude 7.2 earthquake occurred on uh, on 4th of 14th of August 2021 and between the collision zone of uh, between the North American plate and Caribbean plate which are moving around 2 cm per year and there was also another earthquake with magnitude 7 uh, back in 20, uh, 2010, and that was also uh, causing several deaths and uh, uh, and also uh, creating a, a transpressional uh, zone, which which lies between the collisional zone of North American and Caribbean plates. So there there are multiple faults uh, passing through the area. With uh, also uh, with th this one is a strike slip fault, and there are also some and thrust zones uh, in between these plates. So this area is quite complicated in terms of uh, 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 in terms of the earthquakes and also in terms of the uh, plate movement. So I, I use the uh, uh, two uh, two uh, ascending and descending uh, tracks to prof uh, to perform the GMT SAR processing using uh, uh, using uh, 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 using a, for the co-seismic deformation. Here, the first results for the unwrapped, unwrapped phase for the ascending track, uh, in which we used uh, two images for, for uh, 5th of August and 17th of August uh, 2021 for the track of uh, number four. And uh, uh, this is the uh, location of the earthquake um, uh, for the magnitude 7.2. And here was the magnitude uh, 7.0 in 2020, uh, 2010. And uh, uh, we found that the earthquake occurred around uh, on the on the same fault, which is progressing towards the in, towards the east uh, east west direction. For the uh, for around this one, this part is moving towards in, in this direction, and this part is moving to, towards the uh, towards the east. And uh, using these uh, 
using this the same technique i also applied for the gecko's corrections for the for the unwrapped phase and found these results and that seems to be is not a very well uh, applied because it seems that the also the corrections has also reduced the co-seismic deformation whereas in in this this is the wrapped phase in this uh, phase it's 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 very noisy and it's it's difficult to unwrap uh, in this area however it seems that the gmt sar works well for for that earthquake and then i used another image uh, to see that if uh, maybe the pair of uh, 5th august and 17th of august uh, is not working well then i used another image which was uh, on 23rd of august uh, and with, uh, and make interferogram between the 5th of august and the 23rd of august and found a bit reliable results as compared to the previous image so however i found this in in, in this afternoon and I could not plot it in properly for the in the, in the gmt with topography and also with the uh, with the force but it seems that this uh, this and uh, this image gives a better result as compared to the previous one with which has a better resolution a better coherence as compared to the previous one but this uh, this is obviously it, it is around 9 days after the earthquake but it is not entirely due to the co seismic it seems that there is a difference of the interferograms here and also here between these two images with uh, which shows that there is also a could be the signal of the co seismic deformation so this is the wrapped phase for the uh, for the uh, hathi earthquake and this is the unwrapped phase which i took directly from the software and plotted here in the form of image and then using another uh, track for the uh, for the uh, 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 for the and apply for the ascending one and found uh, and found uh, for the descending one for 142 and found uh, that uh, between the images of 3rd of august and 15th of august and earthquake was on 14th of august so this Im image shows uh, that is a is, is could be entirely we can say entirely co seismic because earthquake was occurred just a, a day after a day before and these are the results with with the, with gap with without gecko's correction and we found that there this part is moving towards the, uh, this is ascending one so this is away movement and this is to uh, this is towards the movement and this towards the satellite and this is away the satellite uh, and also i applied the corrections but this the same the same phenomena in which the previous image was occurring that the gecko's corrections uh, has reduced also the co seismic signal as well so we need to uh, we need to carefully apply the gecko's correction in terms to calculate the uh, the true signal of the deformation and this is the line of sight displacement uh, using both without correction and with uh, with gecko's corrections and uh, found a similar kind of results for the for the satellite this part is uh, is, is showing that the earthquake is around uh, this is in, in terms of negative and this is positive so the same but in this uh, for the gecko's correction we see that there is a also reduced uh, uh, gecko's correction uh, has also reduced the uh, the deformation signal in in the descending crack as well so i'm still working on it but the let's is just uh, 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 it's just i mean uh, exercise for the for the bigger earthquake that i found uh, interesting so if there is any questions or comments so i am here thank you so much for that that was great um are there are there any questions i 
guess I could make a comment. Um, first of all, those are nice results, but this is a really challenging area to do INSAR because of the vegetation. And, um, yeah. and so the difference in the quality of the interferograms will depend a lot on whether it was like raining that day or not raining and, and so on. So, you know, your, your second interferogram looked better than the first one, maybe just because the, the weather was different. Um, and the other thing is that this is a good area where L-band from ALOS or NISAR mm -hmm. when it's coming will be much better. So um, it's a tough area, but it looks good. Yeah. Yeah, but it seems um, that the pattern of for the for the if if you see the uh, interferograms pattern, it seems that the earthquake started from here in terms of even for the descending one, so it moves towards the towards this direction, which uh, seems that maybe the four seismic is is we can we could have four seismic in this area in this direction towards the west. Um. From your result, have you compared any of the uh, your line of sight results, the uh, that motion to um, other estimates, and do they agree or are they, you know? Um, yeah, I found some. I, I found uh, Professor Sandwell's paper as well. It's, it's they use the uh, Sentinel and Elos as well. The, the same that like that the Elos gives a better result in terms of the vegetation because of the L band. So. Oh, I, but I could not perform the uh, allos processing yet. But I was trying to do it, but I could not uh, find the results yet. So one thing that UNAVCO, I shouldn't call it UNAVCO anymore, it's EarthScope. They um, archive all this ALOS data that the investigators have ordered from JAXA. And so you can, um, you can get the data from EarthScope. I think you have to write a little proposal, but it's there at, at EarthScope now. So. If you're interested, uh, allows, you could get the ALOS, yeah. ALOS 2 now, I think it's, it's publicly available. I, I, I get the ALOS 2 uh, data in the scans are mode. I mean, it's, it, 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 I just need to make account and then make uh, the lat long which we, where I want to get it. And it's available, uh, like after requesting, it's available after one or two days. You can download oh. it. But the data is quite big, like one image is around 32, 33 <laughs> GBs. So, yeah, exactly. And, yeah. And also, I, I, I haven't tried uh, on the GMT SAR yet, but I, I was trying on the ice, but it works. But the corrections like ionospheric is not working well over there. So that's why I was trying to use the GMT SAR for the loss as well to see if there is, a, it, it has, a, it gives a better results as compared to the other. So. But but yeah, now right we, can, we can get the allows too as well. I didn't know it was open. That's wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we need to make account uh, on on JAXA, and then we make a request. And uh, after a, after one or two days, usually we get a link to download it. But it takes around uh, twenty hours or twenty four hours to <laughs> download it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. The files are too big. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, I think what's interesting too is the ALOS 2 is there's five sub swaths in the, the scan side mode. Um, and I think with, I've only done a, a, a little bit of the processing, but um, so the, the, I don't know, Dave, you, David, you might know, like, is there code for GMT start to, to stitch those sub swaths together or do you have to do it independently? No, they can. I think there's a merge thing, like Sentinel. Okay. Same, same kind of thing. Okay. But, and but in this area, I think in for this earthquake, they they collected a lot of data in strip mode, which is much better. Okay. For this smaller earthquake, yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I'll just say a few things. First of all, these I love these student presentations. They're wonderful, and and we get an we get an idea of of the strengths and problems with the course and what to highlight next time. And I think you'll get a questionnaire from EarthScope about the course and feel free to, you know, tell us the good, the bad and the ugly because it'll help for next time. Um, and and I'd like just to thank all the instructors we had. I think we have 12 instructors and 
I think that individual instruction is really helpful for setting up GMT and GMT SAR. And um, of course, we should thank Melissa and the EarthScope people for um, putting this, helping us put this all together. Melissa spent a lot of time um, making, make, keeping us on track, and um, that's been really helpful. And um, I guess that's about it. Um, Again, you know, I've, I've enjoyed it and, uh, oh yeah, I think you should just continue as you work on this, continue to contract your instructor. I think they'll, they'll be happy to answer your questions or get onto that Slack channel and, and get your questions answered. So um, 